Real Ale opened up in 1996. Uh, Philip Connor was the original owner and brewer, he and his son. They opened it on the town square in Blanco. It was a 15 barrel brew house, two vessel. It was the original brew house that came out of Ryan Heitschkebo Brewing, which was Texas's first microbrewery. I would help him during the week uh, selling his beer to the retail accounts in Austin. And then on the weekends, I would come out to Blanco and help him brew and bottle and keg. I um, got a call from Philip, spring of 1998, and he said that they were having some financial problems keeping the brewery going. They decided they needed to sell the equipment and shut down. Brad made him an offer on the whole brewery. He said the only issue was that I didn't have any money. He was right about that, but I worked out a deal with Philip that uh, would allow me to pay him off over a period of time. And so I did that the summer of 1998. I took over operating the Real Ale Brewing Company. And uh, we were producing about 300 barrels of beer at that time. Lost money for probably the first eight years. I slept on the floor of the brewery for the first three. We'd go in to sell our beers to accounts and most of them would tell us, well, we have all the three beers, Bud Miller and Coors. Uh, so uh, we, we ran into a lot of opposition. Everybody kind of pulled back a little bit, all the retailers. They weren't as excited about new stuff. I started Live Oak with Chip in 96, and 97, I think, was the bubble bursting point of the first wave of craft brewing here in this country. We were going to have a, a kind of a tough road, but I think there was a huge opportunity, too, so we just raised the money as fast as we could, and we got Live Oak going. I had uh, really good brewing equipment, and he had a really good stove. And so we started brewing together, and we were interested in making uh, Pilsner beer, and hardly anybody was doing that. And uh, we got good at it, so we lost our minds and decided to start a brewery. But it was kind of a tricky time to start. It was especially difficult in the 90s, after craft brewing kind of petered out. Um, there also wasn't as much investment, money available. Banks weren't willing to take the risks. I sold out, actually, of uh, Copper Tank to start working on North by Northwest. We had gone through the process of getting an SBA loan, had been given all these indications that, yes, it was going to work out just fine, et cetera. Uh, it gets to the guy who has to approve it. He's the guy who had approved the loan on Armadillo Brewing that went south. So uh, his, he, he just basically you know, put a red X on it and said, brew pubs don't work. We're not loaning money to brew pubs. Well, 12 years later, I would beg to differ. In 1995, we were the fastest growing microbrewery in the United States. Since we couldn't follow our demand anymore, we made a partnership with Miller. They were going to help us to expand the brewery. I think what Pierre sought was a way to distribute his product, because that's what uh, Miller Brewing brought to the table, was, a, you know, trucks, of warehouses, you know, all those things that are so expensive. We were growing too fast, and we thought, oh, yeah, well, we have to sustain this. The excitement is there. You just want to supply people. And you think, like, oh, well, you know, they think the same way. You know, uh, they'll, they'll understand small, small brewing thinking versus mega brewery thinking is completely different. We did our own commercials. We write, we write them in the office and, and we would record them and we didn't care what it said. You know, it was fun. It was, some, some of it was pretty risque, like they call it. You know, and, and then, but with, when you go with a big corporation, it has to be approved through legal, has to be through, I mean, all sorts of departments. And it's like a month would go by, we're like, well, we missed it all. Maybe the big guys didn't understand that market as well as they thought they would. It looked simple. Oh, we'll just make the beer and keep selling it. And they didn't realize what drove that was passion, right? The, the reason people drank uh, that beer was because Pierre Sellis was a great guy. And, I mean, of course, the beer tasted great, but, you know, he was out there promoting and he went to beer festivals and did all those things. And, you know, he slowly moves away from it. And now all of a sudden it's just another beer, right, that a big brewery owns. 
when I was in Pennsylvania, I was working at a, um, a beer festival, and I should have been, you know, repping my own brands, but the Cellus table was right next to me, and the two people at the table didn't know the first thing about the beer. So I ended up working the Victory booth and the Cellus booth simultaneously because I just didn't want to see Pierre's beers treated like that. People were literally skipping the booth. We thought we did a great deal. You know what? We were stupid. In the year 2000, they bought the Cellus Brewery and closed it down a year later because they didn't believe in, in craft beer. They thought, well, you know, that's just going to be a phenomenon for, for a little while and people are going to get tired of it, and then they're going to start drinking pills again. So it was, it was not really a happy marriage, I should say. But, you know, you live and learn. Yeah, well, I won't make that mistake again. When Cellus closed, uh, we lost kind of a... Um, you know, like the crown jewel of the community, a brewing community. They were a big name. And uh, Pierre Salas obviously is uh, internationally known. And when we lost that company, I think the public perception was, was well, this is a fad. And, and I think the overall interest in what we were doing kind of waned a bit because of, of things like that. The market kind of stalled and I could do better leasing the building out we had the brewery in than I could brewing beer. And so I just made the decision that I had had enough and quite a few others stepped aside at the same time, I think. You had a few micros closing, but by and large, the closings were brew pubs. Um, the brew pubs fell victim to the fact that they were all restaurants. This may be a little sacrilege, but for most people, they're a restaurant that happens to make beer. And we all know how restaurants can go, right? That you know, the best ones make it and, and they come and go, right? They're subject to people's whim. Beer got too cheap. There were some folks who decided to compete on the, the dollar level and brought the prices down, and that made it hard for us to make it. What what got Waterloo finally, you know, quadrupled our rent. And there was just there was no way. It just got too expensive to be down there. Copper tank. Bad management, I think, ultimately has to be the culprit on that one. Uh, and the IRS basically came and locked the front door on them, you know, and said, like, nothing moves, you know, told Eric to leave everything exactly where it was. And he's like, look, I got stuff fermenting and things are going on. They're like... i never forget, I was putting uh, Schwartz beer on. I had cleaned the lines. I poured beer through the taps. I tasted the first pint of beer when the lines were clean, and the doors were being padlocked. So. That beer never saw the light of day. They were shut down and all the beer down the drain. Bitter End is actually one of my inspirations and when I did my training for my Brewers Guild, I tried to go to you know do some training under them. Kept trying to call them, uh, never got a call back. Turns out they caught on fire. The landlord had an out clause, and they've been trying to push Bitter End out of there for a while so he could sell the site to build a big high dollar hotel. So after they had the kitchen fire, I think he had that clause that, okay, well, you guys are out of here. It was a shame we were profitable and everybody loved the Bitter End. It's still, if, you, if, if anybody brings it up, you'll, you'll hear a, a, a eulogy that's pretty, pretty tear jerking. Those three, the Waterloo Brewing Company, Bitter End, and Copper Tank, when they shut down, uh, that was pretty much the end of that era.